Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you here this morning as we gather to worship. If you're visiting with us, please join us for coffee and fellowship afterward, after the service. And uh, we also welcome those who are joining us uh, for via, via online. Uh, a special blessing to you as we worship together. We're going to uh, have the children come in in a few minutes. It's Palm Sunday, but before we do that, we're going to rise for the call to worship and um, hear God's greeting. So why don't we rise together? Uh, this is a responsive call to worship. People of God, be gathered together. People of God, await Christ's coming. We've gathered here to worship our God who has brought us to this place. It is He who has also given us salvation. And he greets us this morning with these words, grace and mercy and peace from God our Father through Jesus Christ, His Son, the power of the Holy Spirit, and that God's people say, Amen. We're going to sit down actually to sing the first song because the children will be coming in. Let's sing the first two verses of Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
And we're going to rise and sing the third verse of the same one. And thank you very much, children. we're going to read from Matthew chapter 21 uh, verses 1 to 11 the story of or at least one of the accounts of the uh, triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem uh, the day the Sunday before his crucifixion of course we remember that Good Friday is uh, the day that we celebrate this coming Friday uh, when Jesus was crucified uh, the day uh, the Sunday before though was a very different day from that Good Friday so let's uh, read this uh, passage here from Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, tell them, tell, if anyone says anything to you, tell him what the Lord, that the Lord needs him, them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, as opposed to riding on a horse, a steed, a, a symbol of power. So the disciples went and Jesus did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. And Galilee. If we look at those last two verses, uh, we, we notice that um, the people uh, in Jerusalem didn't know who Jesus was. The crowds that were with Jesus on that road from the Mount of Olives, Olives into Jerusalem were most likely comprised of people who had come from Galilee on their way to the uh, big celebration in Jerusalem, the Passover, which would be the following weekend. And they had known about Jesus, they knew who he was, they had uh, seen him and talked with him, they'd seen his miracles, heard his teachings, and uh, they saw him as being the one who would be the next king. The crowds in Jerusalem were not the same crowds, they didn't know who this Jesus was. And so the ones from Galilee said, this is the one we believe that God has sent to be king of this world, to be the king, the son of David, that uh, it was long promised. We're going to be thinking about that in a little while as we um, uh, look at the sixth covenant that God made in the Old Testament, the covenant that he made with, with uh, David, and that has implications for this as well. But as we consider the fact that Jesus is our king, we then can enter into a prayer confession, and the prayer confession is on the overhead, and if we're going to say this together in unison, um, praying this prayer as we recognize that Jesus is king, but then also understand and acknowledge that we don't always accept him or know him or serve him as our king. Let's pray together. Gracious God, having heard your word, we thankfully remember the life of our Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. Yet we also acknowledge our failure to respond earnestly and faithfully to his witness. We often mistake Jesus for a mere earthly king, friendly companion, or problem solver. 
failing to see him as the ruler of all creation. We do not appreciate the depth of his passion and sacrifice on the cross, failing to acknowledge him as our way of salvation. Even in this Lenten season, we have not walked faithfully in the way of Jesus Christ. Forgive us, we pray, and bring us ever more fully into the joy of union with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's respond then to that prayer by rising to sing all glory, laud, and honor. remain standing as we profess our faith by using the words of the Apostles' Creed, and that each one who believes also say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated, and I invite the children to come forward at this time. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Do you know what this is? You, you all had one, right? It's a palm branch. That's right. Where does it come from? Well, it could, it could be come from. I don't know where it comes from. It could be Hawaii. I don't know where it comes from. It, it comes from a tree, right? It's a, we don't have trees like this that have this kind of branches, do we? 
It's a southern tree. Maybe Hawaii. Israel had these trees. But why do we wave them around today? Because we want to praise God, right? Now, I want to ask a question. How many of you have ever been to a hockey game or to a soccer game or, or watched it on TV? You don't even have to go. What did people generally wear? Or maybe they had a flag? They had jerseys. And those jerseys said what on them? What kind of jerseys did they wear? They, they wore their, their jerseys that have their favorite team on it, right? So if you are like the Maple Leafs, which most people should, then we... <laughs> We would wear a Maple Leaf shirt or maybe a Calgary Flames or uh, maybe there's another team that you like, but you wear the one that you like, right? And you want to show that you love that team. Well, this actually is a way to show that we love Jesus. They didn't have jerseys or they didn't have flags. They just had palm branches because they were on the trees. But it was a way of saying that we know that Jesus is our king and that we love him and we want to follow him and we want to serve him. So this is only just more than a branch. This is a way of saying that we love Jesus. And so we need to remember that. I'm going to give it back. Thank you. So remember when we celebrate Palm Sunday, we're saying that Jesus is our king. Now, is he a normal king? That he goes and has a big throne in Jerusalem? No, our Jesus, we're going to celebrate, died on the cross for our sins. He is a king who loves us and he cares for us. But where's Jesus now? Everywhere, but he is in heaven. He's seated on the throne in heaven, and he's ruling over this whole world. We can be thankful for that, that he is our king. Let's pray together. Let's fold our hands and close our eyes. Jesus, we thank you that you are our king, and that so many years ago you came to Jerusalem, and people saw you as your king. Now, they didn't understand that you had to die first, but we now know that you are the king who rose from the dead and is seated at your right father's right hand. Lord, we thank you that you rule over this entire world. Help us to understand that, and Lord, we pray that we would also be thankful for that. Bless these children as they go to Sunday school or as we learn together here in the sanctuary. We pray that you'll bless us as we read your word and we understand it, that we can also then uh, live by it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Children, why don't you stand up? And congregation, what is your prayer for these children? And also with you. And you can go to Sunday school. And as they're leaving, we're going to sing and stand and sing, Rejoice the Lord is King.
This morning we're going to be looking at the six of the seven covenants that are found in Scripture, and I may have mentioned this last week, I don't remember, but we skipped number five last week uh, because it was, as we're going to, we're going to be looking at it uh, next, on Good Friday, and we'll see that it is probably not the best uh, covenant to talk about on uh, Gem Sunday, which we had last year, week, uh, more appropriate to talk about their verse, because uh, the fifth covenant is a very uh, strange one, and uh, involves some violence uh, and ugliness. But this sixth covenant does not. It, it involves uh, a commitment by David to uh, build the house of the Lord. He has made that commitment in uh, chapter 6. He is, it shows his intention. Um, or actually, in, in uh, chapter 7, he uh, talks about that. And God makes a covenant with him, a covenant that remains in place until today. This is the sixth of the seven covenants of the, the Old Testament. We're going to be reading from 2 Samuel chapter 7, the first uh, 16 verses of that chapter. There we read, After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a palace of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. And Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. That night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I've not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I've been with you wherever you have gone, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men of the earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning have done so since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod of men, with floggings afflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Then Nathan reported this to David, as we can read on. People of God, as we look at this covenant with David, um, we notice that it's uh, called establishing a dynasty is the second uh, subtitle. And I want to talk a bit about dynasties. I uh, did a a brief intercept on that search about dynasties, one of the longest reigning dynasties in uh, our world today. I don't know if you can see that picture. That is Prince Charles, by the way. Or sorry, not Prince, King Charles. Uh, And I, I looked online and I found that there are 70 people listed who could succeed Uh, King Charles as king. I wasn't one of them. I don't think any of you were there either, I'm sorry to say. Uh, We are not in that line of succession. But this uh, whole kingdom of of the House of of Windsor, which only became named that a a few decades ago, uh, first was begun by a man named Alfred the Great, uh, some almost 11 and a half centuries ago. And the the, monarchy has been in place for 1153 years, the same family. Uh, none of us will become part of that British monarch, unless, of course, we um, are royal family. I don't think anybody is of that family here. So we don't have a chance. So that monarchy will continue on through the uh, years. This is called a dynasty. A dynasty is when we see a succession of kings or queens in a family line on through the ages. And this is uh, one of the longest dynasties, as I mentioned, in the history of the world and certainly here in uh, at our present time. 
Now, if we think about dynasties, we know that there was a king who was before David. His name was Saul. Saul was uh, anointed by God, or anointed by Samuel, by, under God's direction, to be the first king of Israel. And God intended to make Saul into a dynasty. God, it was God's intention to say that Saul would become a dynasty, but Saul committed two major sins. And the first sin uh, was found in 1 Samuel 13, where Saul went and offered a sacrifice. Uh, so he was supposed to wait for Samuel, but he said, Samuel's just so long in coming, I want to start this battle. And he went and offered a sacrifice, and Samuel said to him, because of what you've done, Saul, is your son will not succeed you. And so Saul was not going to become a dynasty. And then the second sin was that he did not annihilate his enemies when he was commanded to. And Samuel then announced to Saul, he said to Saul, you will no longer be king. I will remove the throne from you. And that was at that time that David is anointed to replace Saul as king. This is all found in 1 Samuel. We move on through the decades, as it were, and we come to uh, David becoming king. And David was, of course, anointed by king uh, to be king by Samuel, but it took a long time for him to become king in Jerusalem. But when he did, one of his first acts was to conquer Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem was not the capital city of Israel at that point to conquer Jerusalem, make it his capital, and uh, he seated himself as on the throne there. He, he built himself a palace. And then he brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem uh, to, uh, because uh, he indicated that that was God's throne. And that is an act of David. It, it took a while for him to do that. He had uh, intended to do so. And on the way there, of course, uh, we had that problem with Uzzah touching the covenant, are the Ark of the Covenant, and dying. But eventually he got it to Jerusalem. And as he's there bringing it to Jerusalem, he is dancing vigorously before that Ark. He's so excited that the Ark of the Covenant had been brought to Jerusalem. Now, we remember that David's wife, Michael, uh, who was the daughter of Saul, was disgusted by what she saw. And she says, I, I can't believe you would act so uh, improperly as a king. But David said, I, I love the Lord. I, I want to serve him. I'm excited that his, his, the ark is here. And uh, it appears that after that, uh, he had no relations with her and she did not have any children. Saul's line would not continue through Micah. Uh, but we need to remember the, the significance of the ark. The ark was God's throne. It was his throne here in this earth. That, that cover of the ark was where God, from the place from which God ruled the entire world. And so what David is saying when he brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, he's saying, well, I am king here, but I recognize that God is the true king, that God is the one who reigns over all. I submit my life to him. God is the ultimate authority in this place. So David brought the Ark of the Covenant to the Lord. And as David does that, um, he realizes that his own house, his palace, is... is truly magnificent, well, not certainly not the most magnificent palace in the world, but much better than God's palace, because if he's going to put the ark anywhere, and that's where God's throne is going to be, that will be God's palace, and God was living in a tent. God's house was in a tent. Maybe the original ark, our tabernacle, we're not sure, or maybe a renewed one, but certainly the ark of the covenant was not in a permanent house, and David said, that's wrong. We cannot have that. I want to build God a palace. I want to give, build God a house. I want a proper place for the ark to be a proper place where God's throne room can be. So David states his intentions to do that. And when Nathan first hears, he said, well, that sounds like a good idea, David. And Nathan goes home, and that night he, the Lord appears to him and says to him, uh, David, it's not for you to do. You are not to build that house. That will be your son's job. He will build that palace. But what that resulted in was that God made a covenant with David. As a reward for David's loyalty, God made a covenant. And God said to David, David, you wanted to build me a house, but I want to build you a house. This is God's palace. This is God's house in Jerusalem. The temples in biblical times, not only in Israel, but throughout the world, uh, were considered the palace of their God. This is where their God was king. 
and it'll be a substantial building. It was to be permanent. And God, David desired to build a house for the Lord. And because he showed his loyalty, because he showed his, his willingness to serve the Lord, the Lord says to David, I don't need a house, but I will establish your house. And because of that, God says to David, I will make you into a dynasty. Unlike Saul, who had lost that right because of his sin, God says to David, I will make you into a dynasty. Your son, your will receive the throne and his son after that and this will be an everlasting dynasty someone from your house will sit on the throne on your throne forever there will always be a king from your line who rules over my people it's a long time uh, king charles family has been in power for 1100 years probably will be for a while longer but the kingdom, the dynasty that God was promising would last forever, an everlasting dynasty. And this is an unconditional grant. No matter what happens, God will keep his promise. We can remember some of the other covenants, for example, the Sinai covenant or the earlier one with Abraham were conditional. God says, I will keep this covenant. I will pre continue to protect you, but you must live in obedience to me or you must be loyal. There, is no, there are no conditions. This is 100% unconditional. And God makes a promise to David. I'm making a covenant with you. One of your descendants will always reign over my people. But we know well that didn't happen, right? Because as we remember, well now, for example, there's no throne in Jerusalem. And even after a time, there was no king in Israel. And that all began with Solomon. We oftentimes see Solomon as this great and wise king, and he was. He actually expanded the, the territory of, of Israel to, to be much larger than any before. But Solomon is tasked with building God's house. And uh, God has a temple built by Solomon, a palace. And it's truly a magnificent building. You can go online and you can look at some pictures of, of how Solomon's temple was supposed to have looked. We don't, I mean, we're not exactly sure, but, but Solomon's temple was truly a spectacular building. It was made of stone, uh, stone probably quarried from what's called Solomon's uh, Mine, uh, which is just near the temple. It's an underground cavern where the rocks were cut out of it, soft rock when you cut it, it's hard, it hardens in the sun, it becomes brilliant white, it would have been a magnificent building. But there's something about that building that is a bit of a problem, or what Solomon does. As we read on through 1 Kings and, and 6 and 7, we realize that Solomon's commitment to the Lord was not as strong as David's. I want to show you two boxes. These are two boxes, uh, if we look at the left one, that would be the size of the temple, the smaller box. If we look at the right one, that was the size of Solomon's palace. Which is bigger? They are different sizes. Actually. This is not an optical illusion. Sol Solomon's tap tap palace is much, much larger than God's palace. When Solomon finished building his own house, it took him double the time of what it took to build the temple. And we get this fairly strong idea in Solomon as he's building his own palace for himself that he's not like his father David if you would have walked into Jerusalem after Solomon's temple was our palace his, his house was was finished and say these are the palaces of two kings which is more important everybody would have said well the guy that lives in the big house Solomon built a bigger house for himself than for the Lord and Solomon also after he became king, built numerous small little houses throughout Jerusalem that served as shrines or temples or palaces for the gods of the nations. Remember that, that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. A concubine is a woman that you sleep with but are not married to, by the way. He had 700 wives, 300 concubines, and he had built them are God, temples, little palaces, shrines for their gods as well. 
Solomon shows a downfall in the kingdom of Israel, the nation of Israel. And as a result, Solomon's kingdom was divided into two. Israel was to the north, ten tribes, oftentimes called Ephraim, uh, was to the north, not ruled by one of Solomon's descendants, not ruled by the descendant of David, ruled by Jeroboam first, and then that dynasty changed from time to time. There was a southern kingdom, oftentimes are called Judah, consisted of two tribes. The David kings ruled over that tribe, or that kingdom. The northern kingdom was destroyed in 722 BC by the Assyrians, about 150 years later, the southern kingdom of Judah, ruled by a Davidic king, was destroyed in 586 by the Babylonians. And when the Babylonians came, God removed his presence from his palace, from his house, from the temple. And the temple was destroyed. The palaces of the kings were destroyed. The city was destroyed. And it seemed as if it was no more. And we have to ask the question, what happened to God's promise? God had made an unconditional promise to David that one of your descendants will always be on the throne forever. And it seems that God has failed, and certainly the people felt the same. They said, God has failed to keep his promise. But there was a glimmer of hope. If we get to the end of 2 Kings, in 2 Kings 25, verse 25, we find a man named Jehoiachin, who is the descendant of David, who's been the king that's been taken into exile in Babylon, and kings in exile... And there were many kings that were conquered kings in Babylon because Babylon conquered many nations. Those kings were made to eat on the floor. They would sometimes sit before the, um, the king. Uh, they were waiting to watch. And they'd get up with the scraps the king would throw. When we hear then Psalm 23, I prepare a table before you in the presence of my enemies. It's God, or it's a king uh, sitting at the table full of sumptuous food and the enemies have to sit over there. And sometimes they get a scrap and that's what happened. But Jehoiachin, for some reason, or oh God at work, was elevated above the other kings. He was allowed to sit at the king's table. Which is an indication that God hadn't forgotten his promise. But the nation of Israel had become so sinful, and the Davidic kings had led them astray, that he said it can't continue like this. And so that covenant is threatened. It's threatened as David's descendants now aren't on the throne. So what do we do with that? We come to Palm Sunday. And now we have these Galileans who've met Jesus, who've heard him teach, who have uh, now come to Jerusalem on Passover, and Jesus is with them. They say, here is one who is qualified. He's qualified in, in two ways. First of all, he's the son of David, literally. He was a descendant of David. He was of the royal line. He was in succession. And he's also the kind of king we want. When they shouted Hosanna, we oftentimes think of Hosanna as being a, a, a praise word, right? We, we use it as a praise word. It's not. It, it simply means help. It means, Lord, save us. Uh, we probably wouldn't if we're drowning yell Hosanna because people would say, well, what's going on? The guy seems happy. It's not. It's the people lining the streets were calling, Lord, save us, son of David. They're saying, this is a king that God has sent to save us from our enemies. And they believed that God, this, that God had sent David to be a true son of David, one who was uh, in the line, a royal succession, but also one who would restore God's people to what they should be, and one who would establish a kingdom in Israel. Their expectation was that Israel would become an independent nation to remove the Romans from the city and to the countryside. And to set up a kingdom again that would be like David's kingdom, not Solomon's. Because Solomon was not the kind of king they wanted. They wanted a king like David who served and followed the Lord. And so as they're lining the streets, they're saying, Lord, save us. This is the king you have brought. We believe he is the one. But of course, we know well that Jesus didn't come as a military king. Jesus didn't come to rout out the Romans. 
He didn't come to gather an army around himself to defeat that terrible, terrible occupying force. He didn't come to establish a throne in Jerusalem to build a palace for himself beside the temple, smaller hopefully, because Herod's temple was truly magnificent. He didn't come to do that. He came as a king to die on the cross. And the people didn't get that. They didn't understand that. And by Friday, Thursday afternoon, they're now ye- not yelling, Hosanna, save us. They're yelling, kill him. Kill him, crucify him. So they didn't understand the kind of king they were getting. But we know now what kind of king he was. Jesus was not a king to come to conquer the world in military might. He was the kind of king who came to give himself as a sacrifice. And the, the um, covenant we missed, the one that should have come before this, we should have talked about it, is a covenant where God establishes a priest forever over his people. And Jesus is that high priest. But he's not only the high priest, he's also the sacrifice. He came to give his life. The people were shouting Hosanna. And they were shouting Hosanna because they wanted to be saved from the powers around them. But Jesus didn't only come to save us from earthly powers. He came to save us from the great power, the devil, Satan. The one who conquered the world and wants to destroy the world. And Jesus came to save us from him. And he did that on the cross. He did that in a way which is second to none. Because that which was supporting the Roman Empire was none other than the kingdom of darkness. And every kingdom that has existed from then until now is supported by the devil. Any kingdom that stands opposed to the ways of God is part of that kingdom of darkness, but that is defeated. And there's no empire, there's no kingdom that can stand against Jesus Christ because the devil has been defeated at the cross. And so the Hosanna was answered, but not in a way we expect. The Hosanna was answered by the king who gave his life. And we now have a king who reigns on the throne forever, the son of David. Now the problem with, of course, in Israel was Solomon was not the best king. He did a lot for the people and their economy, for their wealth, for their prosperity, for their security. There's kings that followed who did a lot poorer job. Life became miserable under those kings because the kings would change. We all know what that means. We get one prime minister, then another, things change. Get better, get worse. Um, We now have a king who is permanent. The reason we have a king who is forever a Davidic king, a fulfillment of that promise, is because we have a king who lives forever. We have a king who reigns over this universe. So God had promised David this from what we read I'll provide a place for my people Israel and I will plant them so they can have a home of their own and they'll no longer be disturbed. Now what the people of Jesus' time heard was we can live as the nation of Israel in this little small plot of land. But of course, the promised land is really a foreshadowing of eternal life. And I'll provide not a place for only for my people Israel but for all who believe in Jesus. So they can have a home of their own and never be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will give you rest from my enemies and from your enemies. And that's what God has promised us in Jesus Christ and what we already experience. The kingdom of God is a kingdom that will never fail. The kingdom of Jesus Christ that over which he reigns, will last forever. And if we belong to that kingdom, we can have that security and that stability of knowing that our king reigns. Now, it doesn't always seem like that, does it? A lot of instability now. But God has made a promise to David, and he fulfilled it. And we have a king upon the throne who will one day return and call us to live in that everlasting kingdom, the new heaven and the new earth. And I look forward to that. 
Imagine. Imagine being in a time and a place where we together are united in our service to the Lord, in our love for the Lord, in our commitment to the Lord. There's no one who will stand against us. Against us. But a place to call our own will never be disturbed, never have to move, never have to worry about getting old and going to the nursing home and then dying. Never have to worry about being oppressed because we have a king who will give us rest, eternal rest. And his name is Jesus, the son of David. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for what you have given to us. And we, we confess and we know that we live in a world of great instability where forces beyond us seek to destabilize our lives. And, and Lord, we know that that can happen overnight. Sometimes it's a war. Sometimes it's an economic downturn. Sometimes it's a lack of a good crop. Sometimes it's other things, a disease or an illness. But Lord, all these things can take away the stability and security that we have. There's no rest here. We're oftentimes disturbed. But we thank you that we have a king whose name is Jesus, the son of David, fulfillment of the covenant, your promises, a fulfillment that will last forever. We thank you that he will always be our king, that he's king over not only us, but the entire universe working out his plans according to your will, so that one day he will return and we will be gathered with him to live in an everlasting kingdom, a new heaven, a new earth, a new creation, where we will experience the fullness and joy of life. Lord, we pray with the Apostle John. We saw the turmoil of the world around him, and we pray with him, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly, that we may see that you are king in everything. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our response, I think we sang this last week as well, but we're going to sing it this week. Jesus is Lord. Let's rise to sing. we have an opportunity to give of our offerings. Our offerings are for uh, Calvin Theological Seminary. Uh, we have, uh, our, I attended that seminary for at least two years and uh, have grown to appreciate the quality of education that comes from that school. Um, I attended another seminary, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, which is uh, in 
uh, Deerfield, Illinois from the Evangelical Free Church, an excellent school uh, the, uh, academically, and Calvin uh, ranks right up there with the best seminaries in the world. Preparing our uh, uh, pastors and other church leaders for works of service in his kingdom to equip us that we may know and love the Lord. So let's, as we prepare to give up our offerings, let's turn to him in prayer. Lord, we want to pray for Calvin Seminary and for the work that it does. And Lord, we uh, thank you for professors, uh, learned people to, who teach students uh, who can become leaders in the church. Lord, we thank you for their faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for their uh, love for you. Lord, we pray that you'll bless Calvin Seminary. Bless the offerings as we give them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks, Ellen and Joel, for leading us in that and reminding us of the joy that awaits us. This time we have an opportunity to go to our God in prayer. And uh, we last week, I think we prayed for uh, snow. I always do that hesitantly, but we did. <laughs> and we got snow. I would have preferred rain. But anyway, uh, we got snow. And what a blessing it is. And a good quantity of it. It doesn't look like it's quite over. It looks like the next uh, this week we are going to see a bit more. And I'm so thankful for the moisture that God is providing. Let's also remember to pray for the um, unemployed and underemployed. Uh, we know that uh, our economy is good right now. Things are going well, but there's still many, many people who uh, are unemployed or sometimes even worse, underemployed, where they work really hard uh, at their work uh, but can't make a go of it. Uh, sometimes uh, even a salary like you would get at, let's say, Tim Hortons working there would be scarcely enough to cover the rent and the other utilities that, um, that people have to pay. And so it's very difficult for, for many. Let's pray for them. And we also want to give God praise. I, I'm told that Hans Steenbergen has turned 94, or is turning 94. I'm not sure which one it is, but we want to give God thanks for that. And we um, will pray for him as well. Let's come to our God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the, the joy that we have of knowing that what awaits us is a new Jerusalem, a place where, where we will be with you and we will celebrate the the joy of eternal life. Lord, we thank you that <clears throat> we can even trust you, uh, not only for that in the future, but, but even more that we can trust you for the present. And we have prayed to you uh, for weather that is favorable. And we'd like to see sun and warmth, of course, but we thank you so much for the snow and for the quantity of it that has uh, fallen to this earth. And we know that even right now, underneath the blanket of snow, the earth is warm enough to cause that snow to melt and the, the moisture from it to seep into the ground. And Lord, we are thankful for this moisture. We need it in this area of the world so much. Lord, we thank you for answering our prayers. We provide that you would pray that you would continue to provide for our needs. Lord, we thank you for um, the, uh, your continued provision. And uh, we trust you that you will give us what we need to do the work that you've called us to do. Lord, we also thank you for uh, the work that we have and we're thankful for the opportunities to serve others we thank you that we can make money doing so and Lord many of us are, are very well positioned we have lots of money coming in we have more than we need for uh, our basic necessities so we thank you for that Lord we know there are people in our community who are not able to find work maybe they don't have the skills that are needed or the ability to, to uh, transport themselves to where the job is Lord, it's a challenge for them. And Lord, we pray for those who are unemployed, who are searching for work, sometimes with a great deal of sense of futility. We also want to pray for the underemployed, those who, who work hard, who work long hours, um, sometimes more than one job, and uh, don't make enough to have a good living. Lord, we pray that you would provide for them. Lord, we ask for your grace in their lives as well. And we also thank you for the blessings that you give to us, for answer prayer in terms of our health. And, and Lord, we thank you that we can also praise you for years lived. 
and Hans is celebrating 94 years, uh, the third oldest in our congregation, just by a few weeks. Joining with the other two who are already 94, with Ricky, who celebrated just a, a week ago or so, with Klaus, who celebrated a month or so ago. Lord, we thank you that they can celebrate together your gift of life on this earth. And Lord, we thank you for the passing of years that we have. But Lord, also some of us have experienced the loss of loved ones, um, family who have passed away. Uh, maybe we feel too young. It always feels that way. Lord, we thank you also for the hope of eternal life that, that 80 years or 90 years or 60 years is nothing compared to the unending tens of thousands of years that we will have before you. That we've even been there 10,000 years. It would be just as if we'd be done. Lord, we thank you for the hope of eternity as well that we have in Jesus Christ. And may that always be our strength and our, our focus. That what you give us is far more than what we have on this earth. And so we thank you and we pray that we can live by that. Make our decisions through that way. Lord, we pray that you bless us in what we do today. We thank you for the day where you can pause from our labors. We don't have to um, work, that we can trust that you provide for us. Lord, we thank you also that we can make this a day of, of rest for others as well, not forcing them to work. That we can also give them the opportunity to rest as well. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's rise to sing our uh, second to last song, which is Soon and Very Soon We Are Going to See the King. People of God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Let God's people say, Amen. Final song is uh, one that pictures for us that eternal life that God has given to us with words or visions taken from the book of Revelation by the Sea of Crystal. Mm -hmm. 